happy Saturn day, the Sabbath today. Hello, scribers. Thank you for joining. Saturn day, the 2nd of March, year of our Lord, 2019, allegedly. Who do we have in the house? Let's say hello. Let me know if the audio drops out, please. I have just re read out <clears throat> an hour's worth of uh, text and notes on uh, equity, jurisprudence, origin, law history, existence of maxims in law history. And it appears when Andrew said, are you speaking? Then um, you didn't realise I was reading. So that's what you get for not having the camera on. So you couldn't see me. So we'll have the camera on. <clears throat> I'm going to monitor it this time. We'll say hello to explore Scotland, Turkey and Malta. Hi, folks. We're not folks. Folks are flock. Flock, folks. So hello there, brother or sister. Thank you for joining, John. Rose tinted. Let's scroll. Yes, let's scroll, scribers. I like that, John. Yes, brother. Albert, I am that I am. Andrew, you can hear me now. All right, then. So we're cracking on. I'll leave the camera on. And uh, we shall roll. House is busy. We're going into the upper sanctum. <coughs> Forgive me. We're going to go. It's worth waiting for. We'll take questions afterwards. There will be a few, a few mispronunciations <clears throat> of words. You don't have to bear with me. Not have to, but please, I'll ask you to bear with me. Can we do it that way? Yes, we can. I'll turn the camera off sometimes. You don't need to be seeing all this. In. Wash. Got some papers for you. Lots of papers. Into there. Anybody that was on the Sun and Moon with us yesterday, good sort of health and wealth. Thank you. That was uh, a truly excellent hangout. I do enjoy bouncing with Brother Josh. And, um, yes, we uh, we did have a good two and a half hours over on Sun and Moon with Sister Karen yesterday. So I will link the video to, uh, to this channel later today. Here we go. We are live. Let me check it. Can leave that there. Right then, let's get down to business. Origin and history of equity jurisprudence. I'm going to read you the distinction between equity and law, some history, causes of the existence of the equity jurisdiction, separate equitable tribunals, equity jurisdiction in the United States. So if you are an able danger, recent scriber, SPLsPro.com, um, brother or sister that's joined us, firstly, let me say thank you, peace and love from me to you, um, gratitude from the heart, from the mind from the prana out that way. Thank you for joining. Thank you for programming and uh, yourself and uh, self-initiation. Here we go. The origin and history, equity jurisprudence and the distinction between equity and law history, you know, all of that encapsulated. So the distinction between equity in a technical sense and law is a matter not so much of substance or principle as of form and history. Equity, in its technical sense, <clears throat> as used in connection with that system of law known as equitable jurisprudence, means neither natural justice nor even that kind of natural justice which is capable of being judicially enforced. There are many matters of natural justice which cannot be, or at least are not, enforced in any court, either because of the difficulty of framing general rules to meet them, or from the doubtful policy of attempting to give a legal sanction to duties of imperfect obligation, such as charity, gratitude and kindness. Even positive contract obligations barred by the statute of limitations and promises not founded on valid consideration are not enforceable at law or in equity. So too, the administration of natural justice lies largely within the competency of courts of law, which often proceed as far as the nature of the remedies they administer will, per will permit. On the same doctrines as courts of chancery, 
Natural justice or equity in its larger meaning is often covered by legislative enactments and to that extent is therefore excluded from equity in a technical sense. It is in view of these facts that equity, as used in the language of English law, has been so defined or rather described by modern equity writers as being that kind of natural justice which through a through of such a nature as properly to admit being judicially enforced is not enforced by common law courts an omission which is supplied by the courts of equity so i would like to explain here the way that i and others see this um, within our realm and with our in our family at the minute is there is a law land air and water okay now we're going to break down the land the air and the water the law of the land would be man um, in his private, sovereign, self-governing capacity, okay, and you would be trading, levying and bartering would go with that, but trading is the key word, trade. Um, land, air. Air is ecclesiastical, Vatican, um, involving trust management. When um, myself and Andy Sovereign Smith was down at Liverpool, Alderhey, we, um, we asked from the black Catholic priest there um, to be the eyes and ears of the Holy See, and to enact the Holy See, to give I, um, David, Brother Andy, and the uh, the family there, um, the uh, the baby, the the the, the asset um, rights of passage through the Holy See, um, and that's exemplary exemplary um, first our knowledge of what we asked for and what we got, but we wasn't able to conduct and carry out due to denial of authority from the uh, grantors English owners, grantors, testator, um, you know, we've got lots of OR, mortgage or, and then we've got the EE, so OR, um, England grantor, executor, executive, um, certain words, um, correlating America, set law, settlement, set laws, that's your position. So um, the air, ecclesiastical, Vatican, trusts, um, the water, admiralty, maritime, um, you've got your UCC and you've got, uh, yeah, the ecclesiasticals are up in the air. Admiralty, maritime, um, contract, public, UCC, waters, um, admiralty, commerce then. So that's your commerce and that's your public. So there's your land, your air and your water um, in that context of governance with the uh, with the parameters we have dipped in, we are able to say, and we've used and, and, and gone further than most have on your tube. Um, not the furthest, but we're able to put hand on heart and tell you how we see it. So we are, we are recognizing at quite a vast rate, the um, jurisdictions and jurisprudence of many and various. So man and land trade and private is what you would take from that. I would hope. And um, we've got some citations references. I'm going to give you a few, and the publication is available to download on the .com. We are increasing the publications there for the uh, research, development, and education of this realm. So, supplied by the Courts of Equity. And then we went to um, where the court uh, held the statute of frauds to be as binding on courts as, of equity as on courts of law, except when it is being used as an instrument of fraud. That is defined, defines equity as those doctrines and rules primarily, um, primary and remedial rights and remedies, which the common law, <clears throat> by reason of its fixed methods and remedial system, was either unable or inadequate <clears throat> in the regular course of its development to establish, enforce and confer, and which it therefore either tacitly omitted or openly rejected, um, the jurisdiction of the courts of chancery now extends to all civil cases proper in good conscience and honesty for relief or aid as to which the procedure of the common law courts is unsuited to give an adequate remedy or as to which the common law courts were uh, when able to extend their aid have refused to do so judge phelps of baltimore md defines equity as follows by Juridical equity is meant a systemic appeal for the relief from a cramped administration of defective laws 
to the disciplined conscience of a competent magistrate, applying to the special circumstances of defined and limited classes of civil cases, the principles of natural just ice justice, controlled in a measure as well by uh, considerations of. So what do I want to add there? Common law. When we say common law, we mean harm, injury and loss. And also we mean um, common law, harm, injury and loss. And then we also mean the mandated statutory um, codes that are, you know, coming out of Westminster under assumption and presumption upon your person. So um, when we say common law, as we've explained before in our Anglo um, <clears throat> presentations and hangouts and so forth, we have two tier, if not a three tier of the of the of the uh, common law system where you have the common law harm injury and loss which everybody is governable to under default um and then you have the common law westminster codes um federal penal for the americas um, this is an american publication so it's going to have american references about the movements of the privy council and the courts of chancery over here on anglo whilst the judicial realm is adjusting and being established over in america so you have to bear with me for a certain amount, but um, as long as you get that the common law, when you are thinking common law, you need to be thinking penal and statutory, not the harm, injury and loss, and bear that in mind with the, um, with the correlation of, all right? Thank you. Inadequate, right, in a regular. So we've got considerations of. Um, it, way, it may be easily seen <clears throat> that this definition or description is meaningless without some knowledge or understanding of the origin and development of the extraordinary jurisdiction of the English Court of Chancery and the relation it bore to the English judiciary. The importance of the history of the Court of Chancery is not diminished by the Supreme Court Judicator Act of 1873 and its amendments and its amendments, which abolished the distinction between courts of equity and courts of law. By that act, equitable principles were preserved and applied to the administration of justice in all courts. Shadow Dynamics, 1873, adjudicator, what you're saying, we've mentioned this before, yes, you've brought it up, I have. Historical origins. Nor is this history of less importance to the student of equity as it exists in the courts of our own country. In a comparative... Ah, laws. Trust, right. Private, express, trust, laws. Big shout going out to a man like Barry for the chat the other day. Um, governable by the laws of England and Wales. So the laws of England and Wales, okay? Then you've got the laws of the United Kingdom. <clears throat> so we would argue that to publicly commit commerce in admiralty with the sea people as the person in commerce, yeah, laws of the sea, as I've explained previously, <clears throat> that would be one way public commerce and uh, that, that governance. Then you have the trade, man um, and private on the land of the land in our country. So when we speak of country, England and Wales, Britannia, Anglo, um, many, many names for this landmass, OK, so we have to be careful when we call it the country laws of England and Wales, you'd argue, would be the uh, the common law side of it. The laws of the United Kingdom. So we do go quite a way to separate out. If I make a mistake, that's why I tell you to check. Um, none of this is copied. It's from a publication. And I'd like to read you an excerpt um, for educational and entertainment purposes. Clarification, substance over form. Um, and to correlate what Brother Andy is doing over in America um, with the uh, American brothers and sisters over there, we'd like to give you a, a little boost and a thank you and um, some information to help you in front of what may, may be happening later down the line in March in Wales. In a comparatively recent case in the United States Supreme Court, it was held that the equity jurisdiction conferred on the federal courts is the same as that possessed by the High Court of Chancery. One of the rules of the Supreme Court made under the authority of an act of Congress, what exactly, is that when not otherwise directed, the practice in the High Court of Chancery in England shall be followed. In many of the states, the common law and chancery jurisdiction is exercised by the same court, but without changing the essential distinction between legal and equitable principles. 
In other states, separate common law and equity tribunals have been retained, while in others, equitable principles are administered by means of common law or statutory forms. <laughs> Disgusting. It's not funny, but it is funny to read it really when you see that. Public policy, as by established precedent and by positive provisions of law, Phelps, and then we've got quotes, says that equity jurisprudence may be properly be said to be that portion of remedial justice which is, which is exclusively administered by a court of equity. As contradistinguished from the portion of remedial justice which, which is exclusively administered by a court of common law. Blah, blah, blah states that equity is a system of justice which is which was administered by the High Court of Chancery in England in the exercise of its of its extraordinary jurisdiction. And then we've got a lot of citations here for America, a lot of them. Basie versus Gallagher will be the one that I'll read out because that's simple and enough. OK. Origin and history principles uh, admi as administered by the Chancery Courts in England are still recognised and applied unless inconsistent with the statutes and constitutions of the states. Um, we'll talk about the Privy Council and how women were introduced into the law. There was a, once a claim um, in the history and um, we'll go about 1860, maybe 1960. I'm going to paraphrase. You do your own due diligence, but the uh, basic bare bones of it are um, a lady wanted to perhaps bring a claim in law. Um, once the legal system received that claim, they wasn't able to deal with it because up until that point, ladies, female form um, had not been brought into law. So um, we'll say it would be um, Canada that this happened in. And this lady was um, brought uh, forward and the uh, the courts had to write from Canada to the Privy Courts of London. And that's uh, essentially, as I understand it, how the first female was uh, brought into the legal realm and the female form. So uh, there's something there to be recognised as well and what happened and how late on. None of this is thousands of years old. It's within, you know, hundreds of years. So it is quite relevant. And you'll see the kingship, um, judgment ship and kingship correlation as I go through all right but um that's just something um, I'd like furthermore to 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 recognize and um man being born first in time is first in line it must be said that way as you'll see by the equitable maxims and legal lawful maxims I'll bring out later um man is born say the uh, 5th 6th 7 8th 9th of May um registration is on the 25th 26th 27th 28th of May now, there's argumentation of uh, who is the name, who owns the name, who's done what with what name. <clears throat> well, I don't, I'm not a name. I cannot be a name. How can I be a name? I use a name. I was given a name. We. I used to be a DJ. Now I'm a party. What? Yeah, I know. I'm not doing it on purpose, but I used to DJ. Now I'm a party. David and Jeremita. So the name given to me to use, commonly known as the Fool, Crazy Horse, David, Indy. Um, DJ, too many names. Depends what part of the landmass and where I am in the realm to what they call me in Greece. Ella Malaka, you know. <laughs> so Ella Malaka is not mine. I don't own it, but it's hello and um, a, a naughty word there. If you're Greek, uh, you'll know Mediterranean. You'll know that word. So the name, let's get back to it, has been capitalised on. I was here first on the 9th, 8th, 7th, 6th of May. The registration and the claim of right and the bondsman appointment for the state and handing over under the 1302 Unum Sanctum, Attorney Regis, Convocation, 1666. That was done. Subsequently, some days after, man entered the realm. So, first in time is first in line. I would argue, I'm going to argue equitably, that your public, constitutional, legislative, penal crap can go to one side there i would argue that first in time means that i have rights to the name and i will call the equitable right to the name i can prove that man was here first i was given that name um, at the age of zero and then some days later the state claimed that name capitalized on it and through non-disclosure and abuse of trust breach of trust um we, we would argue but maybe it's in honor to protect us till we're old enough to work it out either way um, non-disclosed uh, acts was done um, it was set up and here we are today. Now we're arguing who is the name, 
who owns the name. I hope that clarifies a little something there for you. It's always simple answers to the solutions of these overcomplicated um, things and situations that we're seeing and having put to us um, whilst we're looking at um, noticing appointing secretaries and generals and so forth of this present uh, military we find ourselves in. By order, we would argue, of the um, Italian um, boss. <laughs> We have the papal seas, the bull papil, the current seas, the paper seas. When we go on about the paper seas, papal, bull papil, um, paper proclamations, doctrines, notices, I hope it is now dropping and clarifying and segmenting and we're going to continue. It's all important for how we are. I'm sorry, but I'm now going to stick to it. Um, <clears throat> defines equity as those doctrines and rules primarily and remedial rights and remedies which the common law by reason of its fixed methods and remedial system was either unable or inadequate in the regular course of its development to establish, enforce and confer and which it therefore either tacitly admitted or openly rejected. The jurisdiction of the courts of Chantry now extends to all civil cases in good conscience and honesty for relief or aid as to which the procedure of the common law courts is unsuited to give an adequate remedy or as which to the common law courts when able to extend their aid have refused to do so. Have I read that out? Yes, I have. No, I haven't. I can't remember. Judge Phelps, Baltimore, a distinction between equity and law history. It may be seen easily that this definition or description is meaningless without some knowledge or understanding of the origin and development of the ordinary jurisdiction. What we're saying, bad signal where I am, sounds all right. Yes. All right then. The importance of the history of the Court of Chancery is not diminished by the Supreme Judicator Act of 1873 and its amendments, I did get to there, um, which abolished the distinction between the courts of equity and the courts of law. By that act, equitable principles were preserved and applied to the administration of justice in all courts. Nor is this history of less importance to the student of equity, that's familiar, as it exists in the courts of our own country. Ah, in a comparatively recent case in the United States Supreme Court, um, equity jurisdiction, federal courts, I got that, I got high courts of chancery shall be followed. In many states, the common law and chancery jurisdiction is exercised by the same courts, but without changing the essential jurisdiction, I got that bit. All right, then the jury, the judiciary of early Norman England, the general scheme of judicial organisation existing during the realm of William the Conqueror did not materially form. It had been under Edward prior to the Norman Conquest. So we look at the 1066 now, the land tenure and the doomsday book as well in, in this era, in this age, all right, historians amongst you. The shire or county courts, the hundred moats and borough courts together with the hall moats, manor courts or courts baron of the king and the Norman lords continued to be the ordinary courts of civil jurisdiction. The supreme judicial authority was vested in the king, assisted by his councils. William appointed a chief justice, justiciary to preside over all pleas and suits heard in the Cura Regis, which then for and for a considerable time afterwards was a body composed of barons and high ecclesiastics with legislative, judicial and administrative functions. Professor Pomperoy, in his treatise on equity jurisprudence, says that his creation of a permanent judicial officer off ISA was the germ of the professional common law tribunals having a supreme jurisdiction throughout England, which subsequently became established as part as a part of the government. Distinct from the legislative and executive. The judicial business of the Curia Regis was not separated from the legislative until the reign of Henry II. This was done by assigning the legal work to certain members of the King's Court or Council, who formed what was called the Aula Regis, A-U-L-A, -A, Aula Regis, 
from the time of this separation until the enactment of the Supreme Court Adjudicator Act of 1873. The Aula Regis, or as it was afterwards called, the Court of the King's Bench, continued to be the highest common law tribunal of original jurisdiction. William, the Conqueror, appointed as occasion, required it, certain of his justices to preside over the country or hundred courts of the several provinces and suits which would otherwise have been tried in the king's court were transferred to the courts so constituted. These justices were normally uh, the king's representatives and were appointed to administer or superintend the administration of justice. But they were man, they were really, in many cases, the instruments of extortion and injustice. Really? Sounds ringing true there, doesn't it? Following this practice, itinerant justices or justices in air, E-Y-R-E, air, -E, it's phonics for air, E-Y-R-E, -E, were occasionally appointed by Henry I to go from county to county to hold pleas, civil and criminal. The practice became permanent in the reign of um, Henry, uh, King Henry, justices of Assize and Nisi Prius, yeah, N I S I P R I U S, Prius, and of Gaul, G A O L, delivery were appointed in the reign of Edward I to hold sessions of justice in these provinces. Additional powers were given to these justices and improvements made in their proceedings which superseded the necessity of the appointment of justices in air, and none were appointed after the 10th year of the reign of King Edward, as a consequence of these changes in the administration of justice in the provinces. Almost all the judicial businesses of the business of the country was driven into the king's court, and the county and 100 courts ceased to exist for the purpose of determining controversies between litigants, the king's court followed the king in his journeys to different parts of his kingdom. I've covered, we have covered, and at the seminar in York, I did read out the, um, the history of equity and the equitable lawful maxims and um, some canon stuff. And um, we have covered this, um, you know, very, very uh, extensively. And um, it is now called the Queen's Bench. We have, um, we have the three publications of the, Sovereign Masters Guild, key competence, uh, the foundation level, and the bronze, silver, and gold. You've got the uh, the three courts there uh, mentioned that we would say for obviously England Queen's Bench. Um, you know the Chancery Division now, and what they do in the courts of Chancery. Then you've got Australia and America. Your um, likened courts for that are mentioned and referenced um, in those publications as well. So. Um, we have covered quite a lot of this and it's just further cementing what we've already done and what Sovereign Smith has brought um, between the Americas and the uh, Anglos now. And um, we just uh, basically, um, I need to bring this, some of this to you again. Um, the King's Court followed the King in his journeys to different parts of his kingdom ship. OK, it's a kingdom ship. It's a lordship. So kingdom, kingdom ship, township. All right. These are all ships. Um, just because it's a kingdom doesn't mean it's not a kingdom ship, a lordship, a scholarship. All right. So we we'll say these words properly and we're going to interject Josh's, um, Josh X's help, what he's given me so far and the work that we've constituted together over the last few weeks and, and months. This resulted in great inconsistence to Sutors, ending O-R. Yeah, Sutor, Sutors, S-U-I-T-O-R-S, which was sought to be reminded by one of the articles of Magna Carta, which declared that common pleas should no longer follow the king. Thenceforth, justices were appointed expressly to hear and determine pleas of land, justices of the peace. We would call them just ices, all right, off ices. A just ice, an off ice, yes, with a judgeship. This branch of the King's Court was fixed at Westminster and the dates of the origin of the Court of Common Pleas, perhaps the oldest of all courts emanating from the Curia or Aula Regis, was the Exchequer. This was a board or court. Henry II divided the kingdom into six parts and chose as justices prudent and discreet men. 
what noble prudent and discreet men okay these justices perhaps they were at that time and you know we carry on these justices went from county to county and held police civil as well as criminal the justice the justices in air heard amongst others common pleas in their courts this was an appeal from their decisions to the king's court in all cases they had to give an account of their proceedings which for this purpose was regularly entered in the rolls in the rolls master of the rolls the manor rolls there's lots of rolls here rolls royce yes suits you wear a suit you are a suit or yes commerce and suits so we continue on um, established by William the Conqueror to superintend and manage the royal revenues. To this board or court were added the chief justice, justiciary and the chancellor and such barons and dignitaries of the church as the king selected for the purpose who attended to judge the law and determine all matters of doubt. At first, the jurisdiction of this court was confined to the decision of causes connected with the revenues but its authority was subsequently enlarged by the use of a legal fiction. The plaintiff being permitted to allege that he was a debtor to the crown and the aid of the court was invoked to enable him to recover from the defendant what would enable him to pay his debt to the crown. Ooh, very, very, so hope you, this is cha-ching. In this way, to a certain extent, the jurisdiction of the court of exchequer become concurrent with that of the other superior law courts. You can take that and run with it. The Court of Chancery. The Court of Chancery in the exercise of its ordinary or common law jurisdiction is of very high antiquity. When the Aura Regis or King's Court was broken into pieces and its jurisdiction distributed among the several courts as above designated, the Court of Chancery received its portion. At that time, it is apparent that the Court of Chancery did not exist as a court of equity as distinguished from a court of law. Under the early Norman kings, there existed a select council, always in attendance on the king's person, all right, the king's person, corresponding to what is now termed the privy council. That's why I told you that little bit about the woman and the privy council and what part they played to <laughs> parties. The select council consisted of certain great officers, which who were members ex officio, E, uh, EX space O double F I C I O as the Chancellor, Treasurer, Grand Justiciary, and Justices of the other courts, other courts, and such others, usually barons, earls, and bishops, as the king might name. In early times, probably down to the time of Edward III. This council presided over by the king himself, discussed and decided upon applications for the exercise of the royal prerogative in regard to the matters of judicial cognizance. We're going to get to the praetor in a bit. Smith has brought a word out, okay, and I know I'd read it somewhere, and it bothered me that I heard... It didn't bother me, but it does bother me when I hear YouTube tell me a word. I'm like, what's that mean? I'm not sure I know that one. I don't think I've used that one. I don't think I've written it. I don't I remember... Oh, I do remember reading it. I remember reading it in the publication. 700 and... 50 odd pages just one of these publications has got and um, this is just a, a, a five page excerpt from that so we have got a lot to trawl through when we can digitally reference and research and find it and keep control on f and find praetor then i can know where to go without reading all 750 pages the indigos do have a quite a technological uh, niche on this law renaissance at the minute so yeah, pray it. Uh, it's coming up in a bit. Get ready. At first, the jurisdiction of this court was confined to the decision of causes connected with the revenues, but its authority was subsequently enlarged by the use of a legal fiction. I've got that. All right. The Court of Chancery. I've done that. Edward III. All right, we've got that. All right, then. So we're going to the Great Council of the King, which afterwards became Parliament. Parliament, all right, par li a ment Ment is mind, mente, menti. Uh, also posed and exercised on petition certain judicial functions. If it were impossible for the applicants and petitioners to obtain a remedy in the common law courts, 
their applicants and petitioners were transmitted to the councils, councils, it says here. Um, it is apparent that the Chancellor was the principal officer with reference to the judicial business, which the select council, as well as the great council, had to advise upon or transact. It early became the custom of the king to send certain petitions addressed to him, praying, all right, praying for extraordinary remedies to the chancellor and master of the rolls, or to the chancellor alone. When the chancellor administered relief independently of the council, it was by express delegation from the king and given as it would, um, and given as it would, full stop. Oh, we're still giving the audio. Come on, Chu. Yes, we are. This council had an absolute jurisdiction over all the proceedings in the courts below. If any litigant felt himself aggravated, he applied for redress, R-E-D-R-E-S-S, -S, to the council in the same manner as he would have applied to the king before the latter committed. His prerogative of disturbing justice and equity to his council. The business of this council out of parliament may be reduced to two heads, its deliberative office as a council of advice and its decisive power of jurisdiction. With respect to the first, it is obviously comprehended all subjects of political deliberation, which were usually referred to it by the king, this being in fact the administration or governing council of the state the distinction of a cabinet being introduced in a comparatively modern time. There was a likewise a vast number of petitions continually presented to the council upon which they proceeded no further than to sort, as it were, and forward them by endorsement to the proper courts or advise the suitor what remedy he was then to seek. Thus, some petitions are and were answered. This cannot be done without a new law. Some were turned over to the regular courts as the Chancery or King's Bench, some of greater momentum, moment, some of greater matter were endorsed to be heard before the Great Council. Some concerning the King's interest were referred to the Chancery or select persons of the Council. Houses in Parliament, if the if the matter were remediable at law, no. If the uh, remi remediable, if the uh, if the matter were remediable at law, and there were no obstacles to the remedy being obtained, the petitioner was sent to the common law courts. If it were a matter of revenue, or you know, inland revenue, revenue taxation, fines, fees, forfeits, he was sent to the exchequer. If the matter related to the king's grants, grantor, grantee, grants or was cognizable under the Chancellor's ordinary jurisdiction, he was sent to the Chancery. Seen by the advice of the Council, gradually judicial business of the Council of a civil nature was assumed by the Chancellor as the keeper of the King's conscience. We've mentioned this before, this is uh, going over again. There's no new words here for you. And its chief judicial officer, the inadaptability of the Council for the transaction of judicial business made easier this assumption. The exercise of judicial functions by the king, the select or privy council and the great council or parliament makes clear the fact that the common law courts were clearly insufficient, even in their infancy, infancy, infant, infantry, militants for the needs of the country and that there were civil rights which such court, courts could not protect. We call them unalienable rights, unalienable rights. OK, get to know. <clears throat> the earliest general reference to petitions to the Chancellor is found in Ordinance of blah, blah, blah in the year 1280, complaining of the multitude of petitions presented to the King, which could properly be dealt with by the Chancellor and judges, judge, judge, judgeships, yes, in the judicial realm, and providing that all petitions that touch the seal, the seal, the great seal, the holy seal, the seal is sacred. What seal is this? Shall go first to the Chancellor and those relating to other subjects shall go to the Exchequer, the Justices and other tribunals according to their nature. It thus appears that during the reign of Edward I, it was not yet a fixed practice to send to the Chancellor all petitions coming before the King or his councils, which could not, in the first instance, go to the common law courts. The practice of delegating cases 
coming with the prerogative judicial jurisdiction of the Crown and its councils to the Chancellor, Chancellor, for his sole decision, chance, sell, or. Chan, sell, or. O-R, another one. For his sole, S-O-L-E, decision. Having once commenced, rapidly grew until it became the common method of dealing with such con, con, it's not good for you, see Josh and me chatting, tro, verse, verse, universe, universal, controversies. In the reign of Edward III, the Court of Chancery, as a court of ordinary jurisdiction, became of great importance. But the Chancellor, in the exercise of his common law, um, it is probable that the judicial power of the Chancellor as a law judge and his consequent familiarity within the laws of the realm and experience in adjudicating were the reasons why any case which appeared to the King's judicial prerogative and for which any cause could not be properly examined by the council was naturally referred either by the crown or the council to the chancellor for his sole decision, sole <coughs> decision, not in his public office. Yeah, his sole decision. Very important key words there. Um, appeal, repeal, um, dispute. Uh, whatever may have been the motives, it is certain that the chancellor's equitable jurisdiction commenced in this manner. Ordinary jurisdiction could not avert to matters of conscience, and it still can't. It would not. It would, nevertheless, seem that it was during this reign that the Court of Chancery first existed as a district court for giving relief in cases which required extraordinary remedies. Edward III was a busy king. Well, was he? I'm a busy man. Know how it feels. Edward. Fist bumps of the uh, temporal, spiritual realm. He was a busy king, engaging himself in numerous foreign enterprises and therefore unable to attend to the many petitions which were presented to him. Consequently, in the 22nd year of his reign, he, by a writ of or, or ordinance, referred all matters as were of grace, G, God, seven, race, Josh X, thank you, brother, Gematria, G, G, race, to be dispatched by the Chancellor or Keeper of the Privy Seal. It is generally considered that the Court of Chancery owes its existence as a regular court for administering the extraordinary relief and equitable remedies to this or similar ordinance, does it not? Um, some story quotes Woodersum as deducing the jurisdiction from same source, saying great stress on the ordinance above referred to and also on the statute of which he considers as referring many things to the sole and exclusive cognizance of the Chancellor. And he adds that it seems incontrovertible that the Chancery exercise an equitable jurisdiction, though its practice was perhaps not very flourishing or frequent throughout the reign of Edward III. Newham Davis says, origin and nature of equity to jurisdiction in 1348 by the right by the writ of uh, uh, 22 Edward III, it was enacted. What numbers? 1348, writ 22 Edward III, three there, three lines, three ones, Edward 111, Edward Woodward, Edward, Wood Edward, yes he would, Wood Dug Dug, what a Dug Dug Dug, oh wow, Wood Wood Chuck Chuck, what a Wood Chuck Chuck. Edward III, it was enacted that all matters of G race, grace and favour were to be referred to the Chancellor and to be dispatched either by him or the keeper of the Privy Seal. This was the great step which recognised the equitable as opposed to the legal jurisdiction of the Court of Chancery, although the distinction was not finally established until the following reign. From this date, the Chancellor possessed an independent as well as separate jurisdiction. The ordinance or proclamation above referred to ran as follows. The King to the Sheriffs of London, greetings. For as much as we are greatly and all daily busied in various affairs concerning us and the state of our realm of England, we will that whatsoever business relating as well to the common law of our kingdom as our special grace, cognizable before us, from henceforth be prosecuted as followeth, viz, semicolon, the common law business before Archbishop of Canterbury elect, our Chancellor, by him to be dispatched, and the other matters grantable by our special grace, 
be prosecuted before our said chancellor or our well-beloved clerk, the keeper of the privy seal, so that they or one of them transmit to us such petitions of business, which without consulting us, they cannot determine together with their advice there, thereupon, without any further prosecution to be had before us for the same, that upon inspection thereof, we may further signify to the aforesaid chancellor or keeper our will and pleasure therein, and that none other do it for the future. That's powerful statement. That's some, well, my answer, the standing up. And uh, no other, and, and that none other do for the future appear. However, that matters of grace involving equitable relief and remedies were at this time exclusively sent to the Chancellor at this time. Key moment there, not now. History at this time. American publication reflecting the Great Council of Parliament and the Privy Council still exercise an equitable jurisdiction by delegation from the Sovereign. Now, the Sovereign, the Sovereign, that would be whom? It's American publication, so it's going to be referencing QE2 there, or the uh, King um, himself. If it was now, it would be Queen Elizabeth in the capacity of um, one of the crowns, the Crown of London, crown in the Vatican, the tri-state crown here. We know there are three crowns, so the sovereign would have been the king at the time, as I've mentioned there. Um, Edward III, three one ones, Edward Wood, 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 Chuck, Chuck, what a Wood, Wood, Chuck. <laughs> and the Privy Council still exercise an equitable jurisdiction by delegation from the sovereign. We'll say Edward III, the king, the monarch, okay, the arch, the archie, the monarch, the archon. There you go. From this, the arc of the what? Exactly. From this time, suits were brought before the Chancellor by petition or bill without any preliminary writ. Um, if on the presentation of such petition or bill, the case called for extraordinary interference, a writ was issued on the command of the Chancellor, the command who gives commands, but in the name of the King, by which the party, the party, the DJ, the party complained, what are the real sovereigns? Please stand up. Please stand up. Against was summoned to appear before the court of chancery to answer the complaint and abide by the order of the court. In the reign of Edward III, the court of chancery ceased to follow the king. It was during the reign of Richard II that the Court of Chancery was established as a distinct and permanent court, having a separate jurisdiction within its own peculiar mode of procedure. From the time of the reign of Henry VI, the equity jurisdiction of the court constantly grew in importance, and in the reign of Henry VIII, it expanded into a broad and almost boundless jurisdiction under the fostering care of our nanny state, yeah, the fostering care, the husbandry role, the ambitious wisdom and love uh, of power of Cardinal, it says Wolseley there, pursue such kind of business before us. We command you immediately upon sight hereof to make proclamation of the premises by the statute 17 rich 2 c 6 it was enacted that where persons were compelled to appear before the council or the chancery on suggestions found to be in im true i am true im true improbable impossible i'm possible im true i'm true found to be i am indigo mikey tango romeo uniform echo im true the chancellor should have power to award damages according to his discretion. From time of the passing of this statute, the Court of Chancery was established as a distinct and permanent court, having a separate jurisdiction. Uh, right, so now we need to say statute, chancery, chancery um, managed by, um, yeah, and persons, private business, four persons also have the capability to go one further and uh, make an appointment with them and you would do present in a totally different way with the equitable instrument, the equitable relief should be given um, and other such things of claims of rights and um, equity cards um, are us. You know what I'm saying? So 
Um, while we've mentioned that there are um, legislation and statutes, the Court of Chantry was established as a distinct and permanent court, having a separate jurisdiction. This statute was a solemn, solemn recognition by Parliament of the court as a distinct and permanent tribunal, having a separate jurisdiction and its own modes of procedure and of granting relief. And the enactment was an important event in the legal history of the Chancery um, story. So that just hits home to you what we are saying, why we are saying it, and what we are bothered in, and um, the masters of the roles, the masters of the courts, the masters chambers, the ma stars, 50% um, claim going up to these courts, they're obliged to help you with it. Thank you, Sovereign B, for that little bit there that you're putting in. I'm not giving too much away. I am obliged, everybody that sends me documents, PDF, information, and so forth, not to give everything out because of the damage and the calamity that can follow through getting this mixed up and half doing it with half truths and whole lies. So we have to just follow the process. It pains me how slow it is and how far behind we is we are with it. If we can get sponsorship, endorsement, and moving forward this year, this is what we're getting on, okay? So just bear with us, hear us out, work with us, and um, continue to um, learn by proxy and um, passiveness. The equitable jurisdiction of the Court of Chancery owes its origins to A, the inflexibility and rigidity of the common law, um, B, the inelasticity in, in of the common law system of procedure, and C, the ineffectiveness or inadequacy of the remedies provided by the common law. Inflexibility of the common law. It is frequently asserted that the principles of common law are founded on reason and equity. Doubtless, this is, in a sense, true. So long as the common law was in the course of formation, it was not only susceptible of application to cases within the spirit of existing law, spirit, existing law, take note, but not express, expressly provided for, but also of being applied in accordance with the principles of equity as subsequently known. Precedents established by the decisions of the judges soon came to be considered as of binding authority on succeeding judges. Hence, early in its history, the English common law became essentially a lex scripta. See the publications and the documentations which are entitled the Governor's Master's Trust document and then the one we found on um, WordPress with the, uh, with the Justinian deception and the Vatican outlaw of the uh, um, um, governance of the master servant slave principles and Romney Stewart, Glosser Channel, um, Justinian Deception. We love you. Thank you for that. We claim none of that work. We present it in accordance with our education and under the covenant. I'm looking to speak to Romley, the man. Um, if anybody can link me up, it needs to be done. We are moving fast and in many ways, but this one has been a long time coming. Um, credit to certificate, Secretary of State, um, sovereign countries, Venezuela, Jamaica, birth certificate authenticated secretary of state um some other subsequent moves that i'm going to leave out on purpose getting it back staples too um against dave richards um um notice public notary and so forth and trickery and others um going to the back of the certificate um public private um bonding and so forth ecclesiastical deed poll um we have got another option a different way um international commerce um, birth certificate authenticated, registered for use of 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 trade, trade in a sovereign country, pins and everything. We got loads for you this year. Trust me, it can't come out quick enough. Working an involuntary servitude 40 hours a week and having to cram this in and do what we're doing is just personal torture. It's torture of a of a it's to me, it's personal and uh, it's on the man. It's inflicted, self-inflicted through our ignorance. 41 now i've just completed 40 years in the wilderness um we're going back for relief and um, when a tree has leaves they leave the tree they're called leaves josh x again big love now we're going for equitable remedy cure and maintenance and um equitable relief not equitable interest fixate less on the interest cut the instruments equity instruments relief relief leaves going back to the tree naked tree going back and becoming one with the mother tree, the mother root, the original source. I cannot get what you said to me yesterday, Josh. I'm tingling with it. The walking dead are going back to being alive. 
Dominion, um, all these massive things. Uh, Glossa, Romney Stewart, uh, one of his videos, Cognizance, Remedy, um, Ledger, one of them, he says, you're at the tree of knowledge and the tree of um, life. And uh, Eve, Apple, Icon, Biting, Technology, iPad, Apple, Bite, Eve, Biting, Apple, um, Knowledge. We are now relieving back to the tree of life, original source, look at the cabal, the tree that on many levels, the G and the grace, G race, G seven race, seven G God, R ace, and there's so much more to come. Sunday, hanging out tomorrow with Josh on an evening. I've invited Kev and Andy to come along, um, and hopefully G star can be on the chat room. That is the five, the five cycle, the physical five are going to be there with you tomorrow. We're going to expand on anything that you might be interested in or that you're taking from this. When I say we're confident and strong, this is how confident and strong we are. We are dividing right now the minds of man um, because the time is now and um, what's going on needs urgent, immediate attention. Urgent. So there you go. That was the causes of existence of the equity jurisdiction. And um, there was the A, B and C, inflexibility of the common law. It is frequently asserted that the principles of common law are uh, founded on reason and equity. Doubtless, this is in a sense true. So long as the common laws was in the course of formation, it was not only susceptible of application to cases within the spirit, that's the key word there, of existing law, but not expressly provided for, but also being applied in accordance with the principles of equity as subsequently known. But precedents established by the decisions of judges soon came to be considered as a binding authority on success, and we've covered all of that. Had it not been for the bind, the blind conservatism of the courts of King's Bench, Common Pleas and Exchequer in their regard for the rules and Dr. Rins once formulated by precedents and their inability and unwillingness to furnish remedies for such wrongs as by their nature would permit of redress, the reserve jurisdiction of the King's Council would probably not arose out of the inability of courts of law through the inflexibility of their rules and want of power to adopt judgments to the special circumstance circumstances of cases to reach and complete justice in all cases thomas versus musical mut dot protective union 121 n dot y dot 45 comma 24 n dot e dot 24 have a look at that origin and history continued um the distinct and the distinct equitable jurisdiction of a court of chancery would never have been created mr green in his history of england says the equitable jurisdiction of the chancellor sprang from the defective nature and technical unbending rules of the common law courts on the petition of a party for whose grievance the common law provided no adequate remedy an analogous extension of his powers enabled the chancellor to afford relief in cases of fraud accident or abuse of trust and this side of the jurisdiction was largely extended at a latter time by the results of legislation on the tenure of land by the ecclesiastical bodies it may be correctly assumed, when you assume you make an ass out of you and me, that the ultimate source of equitable jurisdiction was in the king's prerogative to administer justice, the king's conscience, yes, independently of the courts. We have now seen how the common law and equitable jurisdictions of the chancellor arose from the custom of the king and his council to refer matters pertaining to the administration of justice to that officer. But... It is also true that the exercise of the king's prerogative would have been often required had the common law courts been able or willing to provide a remedy for every wrong. Many injuries existed which the common law courts could not relieve. The suitor was therefore, in such cases, compelled to throw himself upon the grace and compassion of the king and council. Well, we are no longer compelled to throw ourselves upon the grace and compassion of the king and the council, we are now compelled to compel you in your fiduciary capacity under your new appointment in the correction of the trust 
relieving us as legal title, going to equitable title, putting you, um, justice, CEO, CFO, etc., into the trustee position as correctly done. He was operating in a trust position before, so you can operate in a trust position now. If you're going to start disclaiming your duties, we will then move forward with the claims for damages. You accept this new appointment. I will now be um, grantor, yeah, set law for the US. Um, the person may be the beneficiary. There may be another beneficiary. Yes, this may be, uh, uh, well, talked about later. So uh, uh, when the equitable jurisdiction of the Court of Chancery became firmly established, he was required to seek relief in that court. The equitable jurisdiction of the Chancellor grew up in the same manner and under the same circumstance as the equitable jurisdiction of the Praetor. There we go. It's all I've left it right to the end. I've worked you all the way through that and I've done some um, lyrical kung fu there just so I can get that word in for you, all right? Um, it was brought to you by brother Andy Sovereign Smith when he was across the, uh, uh, you know, realm on casting on other channels. And that, it, some, a shiver went down my spine when I heard that word. Um, a download happened and I went, what? Pray at all. Pray at all. O-R. I like that. Pray. Yeah. But P-R-A-E-T-O-R. So we go again. We go again. The equitable jurisdiction of the Chancellor grew up in the same manner and under the same circumstance as the equitable jurisdiction of the Praetor at Rome. The Club of Rome, remember them? The alarm bells ringing. Each of them arose from necessity in the actual administration of justice and from the deficiencies of the positive law. There's, there's indications into the pyramid of law and what positive law is and isn't in the, uh, in the foundation publications we've done for you there. The Lex Scripta, or from the inadequacy of the remedies in the prescribed forms, to meet the full EX, EX and G of each particular case. It was not a usurpation for the purpose of acquiring and exercising power, but a beneficial interposition inter to correct gross errors, misconduct claims. Finished. Ah, oh, there's, there's these. We've got these. It goes on. It actually goes on. And uh, I'll take a break. We'll go to comments and then we'll hop back in. All right. Thank you for the 23, John. Explore. It never happened. Lisa. I am that I am. Shadow. Albert. Jerry. Bad signal. Got that, John. Encyclopedia, all right, John, 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 what are you saying about a forum? Not got bad leg. Ewok, hello, Andrew. Servitude, shame, but all right, brother. We pray for you. John, Greg, good day. Easy G Star. Might want you tomorrow evening so you can be part of the fire cycle if that's all right. Um, probably about half eight, nine ish. Chill star. All right, then. Thank you very much. Peace and love to one and all. History of equity and the equitable maxims. Equity will not suffer a wrong to be without a remedy. The role of equity is to supplement the common law and to provide remedies where the common law remedies are inadequate or non-existent. The court of equity was the court of the king's conscience. Impossible to make a law that is universally apt. There is always bound to be a case where the rule results in unfairness. These are the cases where the Court of Equity provides a remedy. 1858, reception of UK law, um, Law and Equity Act, 1873, fusion of law and equity merged into the High Court of Justice, also merged altogether at the same time, admiralty, probate, matrimonial, came to um, via Law and Equity Act, passed 1879, the merger into the common law, which we found um, two and a bit years ago, into the CPR of the equity rulings in with the common law. So the equity was there within the um, civil procedure rules, um, court procedure rules, but we didn't know, and it was hidden whilst we're running around going, Article 61, Magna Carta, um, we're not the debt, we're not the surety, we don't have an international treaty, documents with mixed jurisdictions on, no thumbprints and no autographs, no correction of trusts. We, we was in a really bad way. I don't matter which way you put it, 
we was doing bad. We was very retarded in our ways of um, acknowledgement and what has happened here, our encapsulation. We did say that it was fraud initially, but as the further we get into it, it looks like it looks like um, a very, very clever um, a setup for um, business and management of uh, infants under. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm just saying that um, um, Latin mottos that say um, things that uh, make man's head, you know, ping. Fusion of law. Section 44 of the Law and Equality Act codifies the principle of the Earl of Oxford, 1644 case. If the rules and equity, if the rules of equity and law conflict, equity will prevail. Equity prevails. The Judicator Act has since been added to this butte this year. So learn and make these 20 equitable maxims your best friend. Here we go again. Equity, number one. Equity sees that as done what ought to be done. Number two, equity will not suffer a wrong to be without a remedy. Number three, equity delights in equality. Equity is, equality is equity. Aquiacious est quasi equitas. Number four, one who seeks equity must do equity. Number five, equity aids the vigilant and not the indolent. Number six, equity imputes an intent to fulfill an obligation. Number seven, equity acts in personam, i.e., with man, not on objects. Corporations cannot act in persona. Number eight, equity abhors a forfeiture. Yes, it does. Number nine, equity does not require an idle gesture. Number 10, he who comes into equity must come with clean hands. Number 11, equity delights to do justice and not by halves. 12, equity will take jurisdiction to avoid a mul multiplicity of suits. Number 13, equity follows the law. 14, equity will not assist a volunteer. 15, where equities are equal, the law will prevail. 16, between equal equities, the first order of time shall prevail. First in time, first in line. 17, equity will not compete an imperfect gift. Complete an imperfect gift. 18, equity will not allow a statue to be used as a cloak for fraud. 19. Equity will not allow a trust to fail for wants of a trustee. 20. Equity regards the beneficiary as the true owner. Now, equity was given by the Lord. Lordy, Lordy, Lordy. The world, the res. Plan ET, the plain T, the res. Christians, beneficiaries. So, how have we moved on? How is now the land that was given by the conscious, the um, all Lord, creator, God, grantor of dominion, Lord God, be careful of that one. Um, how has that now been turned into real estate with a license and profits? Incredible, isn't it? Maxims of law. There are 10 essential maxims on the precepts in commercial law. One, workman is worthy of his hire. I've had some claims about me, about man, where they've said I'm not worthy, that I copy, that I get stuff wrong. Yeah, I do get stuff wrong and I do copy from others and I name them, I promote them, I go back. I've just read stuff that's hundreds of years old. Obviously, I wasn't around then, so it's been copied from further publications. All those that are educating and on self-initiation have to copy from somewhere, a vetted, validated, trusted source. Here we are. So we're moving on. Number two, the second maxim is equality before the law or more precisely, all are equal under the law, God's law, moral and natural law. Exodus 21, 23, 25. Leviticus 24, 17, 21. Deuteronomy 1, 17, 19, 21. Matthew 22, 36, 40. Luke 10, 17. Colossus 3, 25. No one is above the law. This is founded on both natural and moral law and is binding on every man. For some to say or act as though he is above the law, it is insane, immoral, heinous and criminal. This is the major insanity in the world today. Man continues to live, act, I believe, and form systems, organisations, governments, laws and processes which presume to be able to supersede or abrogate natural or moral law. But under the commercial law, <laughs> but under commercial law, remember the C 
the land, the air. You see why I did that? Here we go. Man continue, um, but it's under commercial law, natural and moral law. Let's go land law, sovereign, trade, private are binding on everyone and no one can escape it. Commerce by the law of nations ought to be common and not to be controverted into a monopoly and the private gain of the few. <coughs> the Club of Rome. This one is one of the most comforting maxims one could have and your foundation for your peace of mind and your security and your capacity to win and triumph to get your remedy in this business, in commerce, truth is sovereign. Exodus 20, 16, Psalms 117, 2, John 8, 3, 2. Truth were not, if truth were not sovereign in commerce, i.e. all human action and interrelations, there would be no basis for anything, no basis for law and order, no basis, no accountability, um, no liability. There would be no standards, no capacity to resolve anything. It would mean anything goes, each man for himself, and nothing matters. That's worse than the law of the jungle. Commerce, to lie, is to go against the mind, the ment. Oriental proverb, of all that is good, sublime sublimity is supreme. Four, truth is expressed in the form of affidavit. Um, Leviticus 5, 4, 5. Leviticus 6, 3, 5. Leviticus 19, 11, 13. 1, 1, 1, 3. <gasps> Leviticus 19, 11, 13. There's your three ones. Get that up for our one. I want that one. To, I should have noticed that. New Numbers 30, 2. Matthew 5, 33. James 5, 12. An affidavit is your solemn expression of your truth in commerce. An affidavit must be accompanied and must underlay and form the foundation for any commercial transaction whatsoever. There can be no valid commercial transaction without someone putting their neck on the line and stated, this is true, correct, complete, and not meant to mislead. When you issue an affidavit, it is a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. Somebody has to take responsibility for saying that it is a real situation and it can be called um, a true bill, as they say in the grand jury. When you issue an affidavit in commerce, you get the uh, you get the power of an affidavit. You also incur the liability because this has to be a situation where other people might be adversely affected by it. Things change by your affidavit in which are going to affect people's lives. If what you say in your affidavit is in fact not true, then those who are adversely affected can go back at you with justifiable recourse because you lied. You have told a lie as if it were the truth. People, man, depend on your affidavit and when they have lost because you lied, you know, um, five, an unrebatted affidavit stands as truth in commerce, 12. Peter 125, Hebrew 6, 13, 15. Claims made in your affidavit, if not rebutted, emerge as the truth of the matter. Legal maxim, he who does deny admits. Six, an unrebutted affidavit becomes the judgment in commerce. Hebrews 6, 16, 17. There is nothing left to resolve any proceeding in a court, tribunal or arbitration uh, forum consists of a contest or duel, a battle, duel, parlay, parlay meant, parlay, parlay with the mind, duel, duel, um, duality, yin and yang, left and right, blue and red, yeah, probably private, yes and no, liability, no liability, <clears throat> a duel of commercial affidavits wherein the points remaining unrebutted <clears throat> in the end stand as truth and matters to which the judgment of the law is applied. Seven, in commerce, for any matter to be resolved, must be expressed. Hebrews 4, 16. Um, and there's more. Phil, I forget Phil, 4, 6. EPH, I can't even say that one, I forget now. 6, 19, 21. No one is a mind reader. No, I can't read. Yeah. You have to put your position out there. You have to state what the issue is and um, to have someone to talk about and resolve legal maxim. He who fails to assert his rights has none. That's what? That's not nice. That's wrong. Um, the primary users of commercial law and those who best understand and, and codified it in Western civilization are the Jews.
This is Mosaic law. They have had far more than 3,500 years past, which is based upon Babylonian commerce. The, this one is he who leaves the battlefield first loses by default. Book of Job. Matt 1022. This means that uh, affidavit, which is unreported, point for point, stands as a truth in commerce because it hasn't been rebutted. And the judiciary justices of the peace, the judge, has, the banker has left the battlefield. Governments allegedly exist to resolve disputes, conflicts and truth. Governments allegedly exist to be substitutes for the dueling field and the battlefield for such disputes, conflicts of affidavits of truth are resolved peaceably, reasonably, instead of by violence. So people can burning and riots, yes? So people can take their disputes, and man has a dispute, yeah, not people, into court. Um, people appeal, appeal and dispute into court and have them all opened up and resolved instead of going out and marching 10 paces and turning to kill or inquire. Legal maxim, he who does not repel a wrong when he can, occasions it number eight sacrifice is the measure of credibility no willingness to sacrifice equals no liability responsibility authority or measure of conviction no signature on a letter no liability here we go nothing ventured is nothing gained a person must put himself on the line assume a position take a stand as regards to the matter at hand and one cannot realize the potential gain without also exposing himself to the potential of a loss one who is not damaged put at risk or willing to swear an oath on his commercial liability to claim authority acts seven life death of stephen for the truth of his i know stephen is now i didn't used to know stephen but now i know stephen do you know stephen not shaking Stephen, 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 for the truth of his statements and legit legitimacy of his actions has no basis to assert claims or charges and forfeits all credibility and the right legal maxim. He who bears a burden ought also to derive the benefit. Nine, satisfaction of a lien. In commerce, a lien or claim can be satisfied in any one of three ways. Genesis 2 to 3, Matt 4, Revelation by somebody rebutting your affidavit with another affidavit of his own, point by point, until the matter is resolved as to who is correct. In case of non-resolution, you convene a sheriff's common law jury based on the Seventh Amendment, USA, um, concerning a dispute. We talk about UK, Anglo, uh, England and Wales later. Concerning a dispute involving a claim of more than $20, or you can use three disinterested parties um, to make judgment, three good men. The only other way to satisfy a lien is to pay it. Legal maxim, if the plaintiff does not prove his case, the defendant is absolved. Number 10, so the 10th maxim of law is a lien or claim can be satisfied only through a rebutting affidavit, point by point, resolution by jury or payment. Conditional acceptance, Oh, lien or claim. A claim can be satisfied through conditional acceptance as well to remain in honour. That's not a new maxim, but that's the way that we see the management of law. Commercial law, um, management of claims in law upon your person, capital name. Commercial law is non-judicial. This is prejudicial, pre not prejudice. Prejudice. This is timeless. This is the base, the foundation beneath which any government or any of their court systems can possibly exist or function. That means what the courts are doing and what all governments are ultimately adjudicating and making rules about are these basic rules of commercial law. When you go into court and place your hand on the Bible, you say or you would say, I swear the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You have just sworn a commercial affidavit. It is the conflict between the commercial affidavits of truth that gives the court something to talk about that forms the entire basis of its action and its being there in their venue, in our venue. Hence, one of the reasons attorneys always create a controversy or controversies. No court and no judge can overturn or disregard or abrogate somebody's affidavit of truth. The only one who has any capacity or right or responsibility or knowledge to rebut your affidavit of truth is the one who is adversely affected by it. It is their job, their right, their responsibility to speak out and free themselves, to issue their own affidavit because no one can speak it for them. 
No one else can know what your truth is or what has free will, will, free will responsibility to state it. This is man's job and man's alone. We cannot do it. David can't do it. SPLspro.com can't do it. We have to teach it you this way and you unfortunately have to do it. It is the way, it is the only way you can get there. Um, it, uh, your responsibility to state it. This is your job um, at commercial law. This phrase designates the whole body of substantive jurisprudence, i.e. the Uniform Commercial Code, the Truth in Lending Act, applicable to the rights intercourse of persons engaged, engaged in commercial trade, commercial trade, now not private trade, or mercantile pursuits. Black's Law 6 edition. Commercial law maintains the commercial harmony, integrity, and continuity of society. It's also stated as to maintain the peace and dignity of the state over the millennia. These principles, principality, principle, surety, debts, yeah, these principles have been discovered through the existence, experience, and distilled and codified into those 10 fundamental maxims listed, as I've just read to you. There is no legal issue or dispute possible which is not a function of one or more of these principles. The entirety of, wor of wor world commerce now functions in accordance with the Uniform Commercial Code, UCC, uh, the United States Corporation version of the commercial law. The United Kingdom also operates under UCC as well. We'll get to that later. We've covered that before. A collection and how to calculate your damages. Now, here is another aspect of your affidavits in commerce. There is the assessment aspect, which is one who owns who and what and why, how and for what reasons. And there is the collection aspect. The collection aspect is based in international commerce that has existed for more than 6,000 years, okay? Nothing no under the sun here. Again, this is based on Jewish law in a Jewish period, which is in units of three, I think this is a repetition from their publication, it's ringing true already, three weeks, three months, this is why you get the 90 days letters from the uh, IRS, commercial process uh, are non-judicial, they are summary processes, short, concise, without a jury, do you get that, okay, the collection aspect, um, you in which is in units of three um, days, three weeks and three months, this is why you get 90 day letters, from the government, commercial processes are non-judicial. They are summary processes, summary judgments, short, concise, without a jury. The IRS tax office creates the most activity of commercial collection in the entire world. The collection processes is relatively valid, although IRS tax offices agents are not registered to do business in any state. Did you understand what you just read? The IRS is not registered to do business or perform commercial matters in any state. So how do they get all the money they get? answer because you give it to them without requesting proof of claim from them even if they were licensed to give you offers based on arbitrary estimations however this is where things get interesting interesting interest the other phases of matters is the assessment phase there is no valid assessment the tax office has and never can never will and never could ever issue a valid assessment lien or levy it is not possible first of all in order for them to do that there would have to be paperwork, a true bill in commerce. There would have to be a sworn affidavit, affidavit by somebody that this is true, correct and complete and not meant to deceive, which in commerce is essentially the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You can't handle the truth. Yes, you can. I'm giving it to you now. We continue on. Um, when you get into court, nobody um, now, nobody in the tax office is going to take commercial liability for exposing themselves to a lie and have a chance for people to come back at them with a true bill in commerce, a true accounting. This means they would have set forth the contract, the foundational instrument, the foundational instrument with your signature on it, in which you are in default and a list of, of all the wonderful goods and services um, that uh, they have done for you, which you owe them for or a statement of all the damages that you have caused for them, for which you owe them. To my knowledge, no one has ever received goods or service 
from the tax office, IRS, from which they owe money. I personally don't know of anyone that has damaged anybody in the IRS that gives them the right to come after us and say that you owe us money because you damaged me. The assessment phase in the IRS is non-existent. It is a complete possible deception and fraud. Wait a minute. There is one definition of the service that actually applies to the IRS service, the act of bringing a female animal to a male animal to get, you know, so that the owner of the animals may enjoy the products of this union. This is why the rules of commercial law come to our rescue. T.S. Eliot wrote a wonderful little phrase in one of his poems. We shall not cease from exploration and the result of all our exploring will be to arrive at the place of, at which we began and know it for the first time. This is the beginning and this is the end. This closes the circle on the process. One reason why the super rich bankers and the super rich people in the world have been able to literally steal the world and subjugate it, subjugate it and plunder it and bankrupt it and make chattel property literally uh, out of m most of us is because they know and use the rule of commercial law and we don't because we don't know the rules nor use them. We don't know what the game is. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to invoke our rights, remedies <clears throat> and recourses. We get lost in doing everything under the sun, S-O-N, except the one and only thing that is the solution. No one is going to explain to you, me, I, the family, what and how all this is happening to you. That is never going to happen. These powers that have left, that have not divulged the rules of the game, the monopoly, they can and do get away with complete deception and fraud and steal everything, including assets of blood, because no one knows what to do about it. Solution, you need to issue commercial affidavits. You need to consider no instructions or advice here. You don't have to, yeah, don't have to do anything, but you can consider. You can assert yourself in an affidavit um, statement of, uh, you know, intent, truth, plain, simple facts. I have never been presented with any sworn affidavits that would provide validity to your assessment. It is my best and considered judgment that no such paperwork or affidavit exists. At the end of this document, you put your demands on them or requirements and requests can be denied. So we don't go requirements. Yes. Wishes. What, what do you want? Wants can be denied. So at the end of this document, you must put your demands on them. They must be implicit. And then you state, should you consider my position in error, you know what they have to do now, don't you? They must come back with an affidavit which rebuts your affidavit point for point, which means um, they have to provide the paperwork with the real assessment, the true bill in commerce with real sworn affidavits that would make the assessment or claims against you valid. Yesterday was St. David's Day. To all the other Davids out there, happy belated St. David's Day. And um, speaking of affidavits for yesterday, no agent or attorney of a fictitious entity can sign an affidavit um, for a corporation. How can they swear as a fact the corporation has done or not done anything? They do not have the standing. They, do, they cannot and never will provide you with this. This means your affidavit stands as truth in commerce. That's what they see, crux of it there. You can even make it more interesting if you like. You go to all their laws, like Title 18, and you tabulate the whole list of crimes they have committed against in lying to you, um, deception, so forth and so on, assumptions, foreclosing, and selling your home, and issuing lien and levies. This could be quite an impressive list. I'm going to skip all of that out because this is just speculatory chat. It's not concise. Um, and um, right. An arrest for failure to appear where no man, only a trust account was ever charged is a violation of human rights under the International Bill of Human Rights, IBHR, Article 9 of both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, UDHR, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR. Show me the law which proves I have to go to court or show me the paper I sign which proves I agree to. Neither exists. Under the IBHR, UDHR, number six, and ICCPR, number 16, we have the right to be recognised everywhere as a person before the law. We have also the right to waive that right as 
um, in Canada and the States are both signatories to the IBHR. So then all court officers um, as are bound by this international law, which Donald trumps all other laws, which trumps all other laws, which are only corporate statutes. Important. Rewind, selector and play again. The entire court system is commercial uh, UCC, ecclesiastical, maritime, admiralty. Under the guise of a crime, the Crown prosecutor charges the name trust account, not the man, and a constructive trust court case is created. Only trustees who have legal title to the trust can access trust funds, but only via the authorization of the beneficiaries, us, who, have the, who would have the equitable title, who should have the equitable title. Uh, but we haven't. They've used the name in commerce because of the constructed setup. The only changes we authorise are the ones for our benefit. As Andy and I have previously said, maxim of law, the one who creates the liability must provide the remedy. This means that the prosecutor is lie able, able to lie, lie able for unauthorized charges against the trust. So the prosecutor, prosecution is in violation of criminal breach of trust and obtaining execution of valuable security by fraud. They do not want to be liable for their debt to our Trust accounts, equity thieves. That's what they are, this Club of Rome, equity thieves. They do not want to be liable. They unjustly usurp, subjugate, subrogate, enrich themselves, and then by deceiving us into acting as a trustee, surety via intimidation, threat, coercion, and to some extent fraud, force us to pay our debts to society one way or the other. No case has ever anything to do with justice. It is all about accounting, surety, money, and the court never has jurisdiction. The entire case is, uh, is as I say it there, as I see it there. And um, that's it. I'm done. It's Saturday. It's my day of rest. I enjoyed that. That needed to be said. I purposely said it firmly. I had an affirmation about me, um, and I did that on purpose. I said it with gusto. I hope I didn't shout it too loud. 25 on a Saturday afternoon. Thank you for that. You can take this information. This intellectual knowledge um, is not mine. It's not stolen. It's rightfully the property, the proper tie, you know, the intrinsic intellectual value there is, is, is valueless. You cannot put a value on that information. The age of Aquarius, the picture pouring. Um, tomorrow with Josh, we're going to come out of a legal list um, of uh, common phrases, words, adjectives, nouns, pronouns, prefixes, suffix, suffixes, etymological roots. We're going to bunch them up. Then we're going to look at the correlation of the numbers, the letter, the, um, the uh, physical, ethereal, master, um, right, left, everything. So um, I'm very excited, to say the least, about linking up with uh, the X-Man tomorrow. 